Good morning. Uh, I'm Keith Green from the American Retirement Initiative, and we are really pleased that, that you're here this morning. Uh, our focus is really on educating the people who educate people, so uh, working with advisors so that ultimately, uh, by advisors we mean financial advisors, uh, accounting advisors, legal advisors, HR advisors, people who affect a retirement decision and therefore affect retirement outcomes for, you know, for, for millions of Americans. Um, I think we all know that uh, this, every statistic tells us that, uh, that people are, are not ready, uh, generally, and are not nearly as prepared as they need to be. The purpose for summits like this is to bring lots of subject matter experts together. Uh, you will notice that we have videographers uh, here. So within uh, the next uh, couple weeks, it will be up online so that thousands of people will be able to, to click on and see it who can't be here today, but will hopefully benefit from these conversations as much as everyone who's here in the room this morning. So um, that's our goal. We really want to thank uh, SEC University, Commissioner Aguilar, um, everyone who's involved in helping to put this uh, event together. Uh, it, uh, it means a lot uh, to us and what we do, but uh, I think more importantly, it means a lot to people who aren't here today who will be able to, to click on and, and see what we're doing. Uh, it is a, a real pleasure to introduce uh, our good friend and, uh, and leader here, Commissioner Louis Aguilar. And uh, before I, 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 I read some of the, uh, the, the remarks about his bio, uh, I want to say I've known him for for, for a long time and lots of, of different roles, different roles for him and different roles for me. And, uh, and one of the, the continuing sort of uh, strands of, of his career has really been an unswavering uh, commitment to fairness. Uh, in, in this role, as you go back and, and sort of look at a lot of his work over the years that he's been here with the commission, uh, he's really focused on um, fairness for the individual investor. Uh, and, and it's certainly my view that the more people that we have who buy into our economic system because they can participate and have access to, uh, to free and fair markets, uh, the better, the stronger the system becomes and the better all of us are as, as participants in it. But uh, Louis Aguilar uh, has been a commissioner here at the SEC and was sworn in on July 30th uh, excuse me, 31st, uh, 2008. I'm jumping the gun here. Uh, prior to his appointment, one day made all the difference. Uh, prior to his appointment here, uh, he was a partner uh, at the international law firm of uh, McKenna, Long, and Aldridge. So his, he's had a lot of experience both on the legal side and on the, on the investment side. Um, he was general counsel, executive vice president, uh, and corporate secretary of Invesco, the, um, the international uh, asset manager. And he represents the commission as a liaison to both uh, NASA, the North American Securities Administrators Association, uh, and the Council of Securities Regulators of the Americas. Uh, it is such an honor, and I know we're running a little bit late, so, so you'd rather hear him talk than hear me talk. I'd like, like to present to you Commissioner Luis Aguilar. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm delighted to be here today. This is the second year we've hosted this in the SEC. In the sixth year I've been involved with the American Retirement uh, Winter Summit. Uh, we've had many successful summits. They always seem to uh, make my email system go uh, crazy for a few weeks after with people's ideas and appreciation for what we've done. Now, before I continue, just let me do some housekeeping. Now, the standard disclaimer, the things I say, my own views do not necessarily reflect the views of the commission, my fellow commissioners, or members of the commission. Secondly, um, 
because you're going to hear a lot of statistics and you're going to hear a lot of facts. I'm a big believer in what President John Adams once said, that the facts are a stubborn thing. You can't run away from the facts. Um, and so when I was looking at the plight of our seniors and the retirees, if I just told you how bad it was, you may get a lot of facts. Uh, I will also tell you that my speech will be on the web later today, and it's a repeat with copious facts that would bore you to death here, but uh, it will really drive home the point that uh, seminars such as this are very crucial to waking people up to what they need to do going forward, wake up the commissioners to the attention we need to pay and our rules of enforcement to While many, while many Americans have worked hard throughout their lifetime, the 2014 survey found that 34 percent of middle-class Americans currently are not making any contributions to a 401k, IRA, or any other type of retirement vehicle, with 41 percent between the ages of 50 and 59 not saving for retirement at all. Almost one-third of those surveyed said that they will not have enough money for retirement, that number increased to almost 50% for those in their 50s. Indeed, a full 19% do not have any retirement savings at all. Middle class Americans now believe that they will need to work until they're at least 80 years old because they lack retirement savings. Now, just last month, a report by the Center for American Progress showed that millions of Americans will not have enough savings to maintain their standard of living in retirement and that this problem will only get worse over time. As a result, retiring Americans will have to rely heavily on their families, charities, and on the government to make ends meet. There are several reasons for why Americans fail to plan for retirement. But one obvious reason relates to the lack of knowledge or being confused about what to do. For example, a recent report found that only 20% of Americans can answer basic questions about retirement literacy. The survey tested knowledge in several areas of retirement income preparedness, such as knowledge of investment products and the importance of preserving assets in retirement. This lack of knowledge has important consequences for all Americans planning for retirement. Investment pro products are becoming increasingly complex, increasingly opaque, harder to understand. Unfortunately, even those investors diligently saving for retirement may not have all the information that they need. Indeed, investment knowledge is becoming more important as employers have moved from defined benefit plans toward defined contribution plans. The growth in the popularity of 401k plans requires more Americans to make their own investment decisions for retirement, while at the same time addressing threats to the retirement nest eggs through health care costs or inflation. Accordingly, the questions then become, are Americans able to make informed investment decisions? Do they have the critical information that they need? Americans plan for retirement. They need to have adequate and understandable information about their investments. Now, today I want to focus on two types of investments that seem to be the most prevalent investments made by seniors and by those planning for retirement. First, I want to focus on target date funds. These funds automatically rebalance the mix of stocks, bonds, and other investments to become more conservative as time passes. Target date funds have become an attractive option for employees who do not want to actively manage their retirement savings themselves. Second, I want to focus on the municipal securities market. According to a 2012 GAO report, retail investors own about 75% of the estimated $3.7 trillion in the U.S. municipal securities market. In addition, the AARP has reported that municipal, bond, that municipal bonds ranked high on the list of investments recommended by financial planners. First, let's turn to target date funds. Since the mid-1990s, investments in target date funds have grown exponentially. It's been reported that approximately 72% of 401k plans offer target date funds. By the end of 2012, target date funds accounted for 15%, 15 of all 401k assets, and that figure is expected to grow astronomically in the coming years. Investors' affinity for target date funds is not hard to understand. These, often, these funds offer an appealing and reassuring simplicity for those who lack the time or the expertise to plan for their retirement. Moreover, after the enactment of the Pension Protection Act, target date funds became eligible to be so-called qualified default investment alternatives. 
thus the target date fund may not be an investor's active choice, but rather the default option within his or her 401k plan. Target date funds have even been referred to as autopilot investing as they allow investors to rely entirely on financial experts to make important decisions about migrating from riskier access assets to safer ones as investors. As you can guess, these funds are particularly attractive to investors who are not financially experienced. And evidence suggests that investors may perceive these funds to be virtually risk-free. This perception is fueled in part by marketing materials suggesting that target date funds automatic rebalancing feature makes them so safe that investors need not monitor their investments closely. In fact, some target date funds actually encourage investors to, and I quote, set it and forget it, unquote. The perception of these funds as safe is further fueled by how most retirement plans utilize them as their default investment, and this default status seems to imply that these funds are among the safer options available. Target date funds, however, do not contain guarantees. Investors in these funds are not assured that they will have sufficient retirement income at the target date, and there is absolutely no guarantee that investors will lose, there's absolutely no guarantee, and that's important there, there's absolutely no guarantee that investors will not lose some or even all of their investments. Recent experience has shown this to be true. For example, in 2008, investors who invested in funds with a 2010 target date found themselves facing average losses of, of 30%, just two years before their presumed retirement date. Some of these investors faced losses as high as 41%. Fortunately, these losses only grew in the following year. This experience should have served as a wake-up call that target date funds were not performing as advertised. Yet, as of today, the Commission has not enacted a single rule dealing with target date funds disclosure. Two rules dealing with target date funds disclosure. The Commission to act has taken on an added urgency as investors have continued to invest in target date funds in record numbers. In fact, the total amount of assets invested in target date funds and similar investment vehicles has reached almost $1 trillion. This market is expected to continue to grow in the coming years and by one, by one estimate could quadruple in size by 2020. Importantly, the vast majority of these funds are held in retirement accounts. It is estimated that within, within five years, target date funds could capture almost 90% of all new contributions to 401k. The relentless growth in target date funds is troubling because studies have shown that investors and industry professionals alike did not fully appreciate the risk that these funds present. For example, in 2012, the Commission sponsored a study to assess investors' understanding of target date funds, and the study yielded several al alarming findings. For example, first, fewer than one-third of respondents were able to identify the correct meaning of the year in the target date's fund's name. Second, only 36% of respondents were aware the target date funds do not provide guaranteed income after retirement. They're not an annuity. Third, more than half of all respondents failed to realize the target date funds with the same years in their name. <laughs> not necessarily have the same mix of stocks and bonds at the target date. When you think God's about to break in, you have to slow down. <laughs> just don't know what he's about to say. He may be as upset with these statistics as I am. Uh, let me just cover the last one again, because I think that's what we're talking about. The level of confusion is just mind-boggling. More than half of our respondents failed to realize that target date funds with the same year in their name do not necessarily have the same mix of stocks and bonds at the target date. Fourth, the principal reason that given for choosing a target date fund so that was that it, quote, it seems like a safe investment for retirement. <laughs> Equally alarming is that in 2010, PIMCO conducted a study that found that professional consultants who help select options for retirement plans underestimate the degree of risk presented by target date funds. Specifically, this study found that two-thirds of these consultants mistakenly assumed that target date funds are more conservatively invested than was, in fact, the case. Unfortunately, it seems that the problem has become worse. Not only have target date funds quadrupled since 2008, but the percentage of allocation allocated to equities has also grown. Since 2005, 
many target date funds have boosted their allocations to equities, both by extending their glide paths beyond the target date and by increasing the equity allocations across the entire glide path. Now, in and of itself, that may not be inappropriate, as a greater exposure to equities may allow for greater returns. The issue to me, however, is whether investors have the information and disclosure they need to appreciate the risks involved in having greater allocation to equities, which generally are presumed to be safer than fixed income instruments. Moreover, the day market also poses challenges for target date funds even as to their fixed income instruments. For example, many experts are warning of a sharp decline in the bond market in the coming year. The belief is that an improving economy will eventually force the Federal Reserve to raise interest rates, and that this may cause another taper tantrum in which bond prices will simply plummet. This possibility raises a number of questions for target date funds. For example, how to warn investors about this potential market disruption. What are these funds doing to prepare for another possible taper tantrum? Are they diversifying into other assets besides bonds? If so, does this present new risks that should be disclosed to investors? And how do we go about disclosing those risks to investors? And how do we make sure investors know and understand these risks? Sadly, many of these concerns are not new. In April 2013, the SEC's Investor Advisory Committee Found that, that found that individual investors are ill-equipped to identify risk, disparity, risk disparities between target date funds bearing the exact same date. The IC considered the existing problem and made a number of recommendations of the Commission to enhance the disclosure that should be provided to investors. Specifically, among others, the, com the Committee made the following five recommendations. First, the target date fund prospectuses should clearly explain the policies and assumptions used to design and manage the desired level of risk over the life of the fund. Second, that the marketing materials should include warnings that the funds are not guaranteed and that losses are possible, including at or after the target date. Third, the target date should provide better information about fees and how those fees impact an investor's final return. Fourth, that the Commission develop a glide path illustration for target date funds that's based on a standardized measure of risks. And fifth, that the Commission adopts standardized methodologies for both the risk-based and asset allocation glide path illustrations so that different target funds can at least play off the same benchmark. Now, the Commission sought public comments on these IAC recommendations, and that comment period has long since expired. The SEC should move quickly to advise the SEC staff should move quickly to advise the Commission how best to proceed forward to help individual investors and plan providers. It's imperative that investors better understand the risks presented by target date funds. In addition, the SEC staff should also dust off the Commission's now forgotten, perhaps abandoned, 2010 target date fund proposal and consider what actions may be appropriate in light of all the evidence gathered. Uh, some, while I recognize that the industry has improved disclosure in recent years, the current disclosure regime needs further improvement. The stakes are too high to continue to delay. With the end of an historic period of low interest rates rapidly approaching, the consequence, consequences of investors continuing to be ill-informed about the inherent risk of target dates are simply too grave. Having sought public comment, having received public comment, having understood the nature of the problem, having become aware that the problem is only getting worse, at some point you have to look inward and realize that the Commission is not contributing to the problem, not working to solve the problem. I can assure you through speeches such as this, I'm trying to do a wake-up call. But call. And, uh, let's see if we can get something done. Now I want to turn my attention to the municipal bond market and the need for better disclosures there as well. As the ARP has noted, municipal bonds tend to rank high on the list of investments that financial planners recommend to people who are nearing or who have reached retirement. Despite its size and importance, however, the municipal securities market has not been subject to the same level of regulation and transparency as other segments of the U.S. capital markets. Both the disclosure and trading environments for municipal securities differ greatly from equities. Accordingly, 
I want to focus on certain improvements that should be made to the disclosures that are provided to investors. It is well recognized that municipal securities market is an area in need of enhanced disclosure. However, short of a congressional fix to repeal the Tower Amendment, which limits the Commission's authority to regulate municipal securities offerings, the Commission's ability to oversee municipal securities and protect investors is generally limited to two areas. First, we can require municipal bond under underwriters to ensure that issuers provide investors with certain, certain limited disclosures. And second, we can sue people under enforcement authority. In fact, the Commission has often used its enforcement powers to tackle head-on the entrenched practice among issuers of municipal securities to provide inadequate disclosures. This is reflected by the Commission's recent Municipalities Continuing Disclosure Cooperative Initiative, that's a mouthful, MCDCIA is how we refer to it. That's an initiative which, according to some market participants, has instilled shock and awe in issuers and underwriters and is hopefully prompting efforts toward timely and full disclosures. There are, however, more things they can do beyond shock and awing. There are things we can do to enhance disclosure practice in municipal securities markets. Municipal bond markets' breadth and diversity does resist general, broad generalizations, but certain characteristics set this market apart from others. For example, although it is less than half the size of the corporate bond market in terms of total principal outstanding, the municipal bond market is estimated to have more than 1.5 million different types of bonds, which is 20 times the number of corporate bond types. A wide variety of municipal bond types stems from a number of factors, including the fact that municipal bonds frequently have non-standardized features, such as calls, puts, and sinking funds, and they're oftentimes bundled with derivatives. Uh, these almost endless permutations give rise to a high degree of complexity, which can easily confuse investors, thus begs for better and more clear disclosures. Investors and other market participants have long criticized the quality, consistency, and timeliness of disclosures in the municipal bond markets. For example, with respect to so-called initial disclosures that are made when bonds were first issued, there are concerns over the absence of certain basic detailed information about the particular issuer's outstanding debt, such as liens and collateral pledges. There is also widespread concern that issuers are not disclosing bank loans, which issuers have been pursuing in greater numbers in recent years. Also, like issuers in other markets, municipal bond issuers have, have an obligation to provide continuing disclosure. But here, too, there are pervasive problems. Industry participants have complained that many issuers struggle to meet their obligations to provide complete and timely disclosure into the secondary market. I'm grateful that industry efforts have yielded some improvement in recent years. And the ability, availability of disclosures has advanced considerably since the Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board's electronic municipal market access system, better known as PEMIC, began serving as a central repository for municipal issuer disclosures in 2008. Nonetheless, serious problems remain. This is evident by the numerous enforcement actions the Commission has brought in recent years against municipal issuers, both small and large, for failing to make disclosure or for making disclosures that ran afoul of the anti-fraud provisions of municipal securities laws. The disconcerting fact is that these problems are neither new nor hidden. A 2012 Commission report analyzed the state of the municipal securities market and offered several recommendations for addressing these problems. Among other things, the reports recommend that the Commission use its existing, albeit limited, authority to amend its rules to do the following. First, require fuller and more specific types of disclosures in the initial offering document, including the final terms of the offering and the price to be paid for the municipal securities in the initial, in the initial issuance. Had a V8. That's just common sense. And yet we don't require that. Second, mandate more specific types of ongoing disclosures, including disclosures concerning the issuance of new debt. Third, provide a method to address noncompliance with continuing disclosure requirements. Fourth, make disclosures easier to understand. Here, the report essentially called for issuers to use plain English and to provide executive summaries. Both common sense suggestions that boggles my mind where we have an under. Fortunately, to date, the Commission has not pursued these measures, which has left the individual investors who comprise the vast majority of municipal bondholders vulnerable. 
I urge the Commission to, care, to carefully consider these and other proposals set forth in the 2012 report to make the municipal securities market more transparent and fair for investors. As you know, the Commission's chief mandate is to protect investors. Enhancing disclosure in the municipal securities market will do much to achieve that goal. To conclude, <coughs> excuse me, to conclude, the investment products and the capital market structure has become exponentially more complicated, and investors find an even greater need for enhanced transparency in the marketplace. As regulators, the SEC must work harder to ensure that investors have timely, accurate, useful, and high-quality disclosure materials in order to make informed investment decisions. This is true as to many products, but it is particularly true to those products on which Americans are increasingly reliant for financial security. Uh, just to give a quick shout out to Lori and her team, it's not like we're, you know, there's a lot we can do. I've been as critical as you can be, as I can be, to the commission. I probably could be more critical, but we're critical, but it's not to say we're not doing it. Uh, so the SEC website does contain a number of helpful hints uh, about how individuals can go manage their investments, uh, risks to be wary of, fraud situations to be looking for. There's a great publication called Questions You Should Ask About Your Investment. And I would refer you to our web tool, and maybe Lori will talk about it later. It's a good tool to use. Unfortunately, not many Americans can get to it. Uh, in closing, uh, I do want to thank the whole army of individuals that put this together uh, from the SEC style. I want to particularly highlight Maya Sams and Dennis Trusky from the SEC University for working with Keith and me over the past few months to put together this event. Please give them a round of applause. They did. <laughs> also want to thank today's panelists of experts from inside and outside the SEC for taking the time to contribute their knowledge and expertise to today's program. Uh, I myself am feeling my own personal pains as my chief of staff on the next panel, which has had her focus on that panel instead of taking care of some of my other needs. It's fine. Uh, it's an important panel. I commend you for it. Smita Ramaratha, many of you know her. Uh, this event helps support, protect, and empower our nation's investors as they make important investment decisions for their future. I encourage audience participation. I encourage your follow-up. I encourage your letters and comments and feedback. Uh, to make this uh, program better in the years to come. And thank you, and thank you for being here, and thank you for having me here. Thank you.